All right, let's get started. Um, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. So again, good afternoon and welcome to Federal Courts Fundamentals and Why Catholics Should Care. We're so thrilled that you're here for today's critical and timely conversation. As many of you know, Joe Biden, our nation's first pro-choice Catholic president, has promised to nominate the first ever black woman to serve on the Supreme Court of the United States. As we celebrate Black History Month, we'll discuss the significance of this promise and what it means for the future of our country. Today, we'll answer questions such as, how does the judicial nominations process work? What's really at stake? Why do all federal courts, including our Supreme Court and lower courts matter? And perhaps most importantly, how can pro-choice Catholics get involved and support the confirmation of fair, independent, and qualified judges? who reflect the diversity of our nation. So to start off, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Marley Breakstone. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the state policy associate at Catholics for Choice. My colleague, Shannon Russell, CFC's director of policy, will be moderating today's conversation. Today, we're joined by a distinguished panel of amazing speakers, including Brandi Collender, co-founder of She Will Rise, an initiative working to ensure greater equality within America by ensuring that a black woman justice is on the Supreme Court for the first time ever. Brandi is a problem solver and strategist with a deep passion for issues surrounding equity and the environment. An attorney and sustainability practitioner with deep public policy expertise, she has worked across all sectors and testified before Congress and state governing bodies. She previously served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Land and Minerals Management at the US Department of Interior, advancing policy and regulations for the nation's four energy development bureaus, as well as Deputy General Counsel for the White House Council on Environmental Quality, advancing infrastructure, climate, and environmental justice priorities. Prior to her federal service, Brandy was an attorney with the Natural Resources Defense Council. She earned her master in environmental management at Yale University, a JD from Vermont Law School, and a bachelor in urban and environmental planning from the University of Virginia. We're also joined by Jody Ravon. Chief Policy Officer at the, National Policy, at the National Council of Jewish Women. As head of the organization's government relations and advocacy work, Jody helps lead the organization's advocacy efforts in Washington and plays a key role in mobilizing effective grassroots work on the organization's issues and campaigns around the country. In her role as Chief Policy Officer, Jody works with the CEO and the board directors to create policy and advocacy strategy for the organization. Over the years, Jody has represented NCJW on national coalitions concerned with civil rights, economic justice issues, intimate partner violence, gun violence, and human trafficking, among other issues. Jody graduated from Baltimore Institute for Jewish Communal Service with an MA in social work, an MA in Jewish Studies and a certificate in Jewish Communal Studies. She also earned her BA in Political Science from Boston University. And last but certainly not least, I'm pleased to introduce Nina Sariam. Since 2002, Nina has advocated on local, state, and national levels for reproductive health rights and justice, gender equity, LGBTQ rights, and ending gender-based violence. Nina is currently the Associate Director of Legislative Affairs at Planned Parenthood Federation of America in Washington, DC, where she manages a deep legislative, a deep portfolio of legislative issues, including abortion bans and restrictions, LGBTQ issues, judicial nominations, immigration, and other matters before the Senate, House, and Judiciary Committees and the US Supreme Court. Previously, she oversaw the sexual and reproductive health equity portfolio at the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Justice, 
working to protect Title X, Medicaid coverage, the Affordable Care Act, and contraceptive access. Nina holds a master's degree in political science and history from College of St. Rose. She graduated from Casanova College with a bachelor's in social science and minors in pre-law, sociology, and history. Now, before we get started, let's quickly go over some general logistics and housekeeping. Um, as you're probably aware, this is a Zoom webinar, so you'll be unable to chat with the general audience or show yourselves on camera or unmute your mics. Keep in mind there will be a Q&A portion at the end of this presentation, so if you have any questions or concerns or if you want to ask a question to be answered during the Q&A at the end, you can submit those using the question and answer function on Zoom. This webinar will also be recorded and shared with registrants later this week. And it will also be available on YouTube. So now what we've all been looking forward to, I'll pass the mic to Shannon so that we can talk about the courts. Great, thank you so much, Marley. And thanks so much to all of you for being with us today, especially to our wonderful panelists. Nina, let's start with you um, and some of the basics. So what can you tell me about the federal courts and how they work? Like how many cases do they hear each year? About what topics? And are the lower courts as important as the Supreme Court? Thanks, Shannon. I'm thrilled to be with you all today. Um, so the Constitution guides the structure of our federal courts. Um, specifically, Article Three of the Constitution establishes the federal judiciary, uh, which is currently made up of 870 judges. Um, the Supreme or the Constitution specifically says that there will be one Supreme Court, but Congress is able to decide the specifics of the lower courts, which we'll get into a bit more. Um, the federal court system has three main levels, uh, the district courts, the circuit courts, which are the first level of appeal, and then the Supreme Court, which is uh, what most people are most familiar with. Um, for the district courts, there's 94 district courts, uh, 13 circuit courts, and again, one Supreme Court. Um, the Court of Appeals has 179 justices. Uh, district courts have at least one district in each state, uh, plus DC, Puerto Rico, and has 677 just judges. Uh, one thing to note is since uh, the Trump presidency, now one in three judges on the Court of Appeals is now a pick from President Trump. So when we say um, he really reshaped the judiciary, um, that kind of gives, gives a sense of um, how much? Um, so the federal courts hear cases that arise under federal statute, the constitution and treaties. Um, there's over 400,000 cases filed in federal district court and circuit courts each year. That's a lot of cases. <laughs> um, and these cases cover discrimination, civil rights claims, um, criminal prosecutions, but also uh, cases about the environment and other issues that I know all of us care deeply about, like uh, abortion rights, LGBTQ rights, and other, other issues. Um, so the Supreme Court typically makes the news most frequently, um, but they actually hear fewer than 100 cases each term. Um, so the vast majority of the cases are actually heard in district and circuit court, uh, meaning that the lower courts actually have the last word on a lot of these issues, um, and the Supreme Court hears very few cases. Um, so one example of this is, although the Supreme Court's hearing a direct challenge to Roe v. Wade um, in the Jackson Women's Health case that they heard oral arguments on December 1st, uh, the lower courts are actually hearing the majority of um, abortion bans and restrictions that are moving um, through the courts. Um, and just to say it, because it needs to be said, um, the courts have been really instrumental in decriminalizing um, abortion and LGBTQ lives. Um, so the lower courts are really essential to moving us forward in ways that people have the ability to de um, determine if, when, and how to parent and how to live in healthy and safe environments. Thanks so much for that, Nina. I think that like people are aware of, you know, the significance of the Supreme Court, but the lower courts are often unrecognized. And like you said, they are often the final word on a lot of our rights in a lot of these cases. So it's so important that we talk about not just the Supreme Court, but our lower courts as well. So how does one even become a federal judge? How long do they serve? 
And what roles do the executive and legislative branches play in the judicial nominations process? And how has this, how has systemic racism shaped the current makeup of our federal judiciary? This is such a great, great question. I feel like um, for most folks, how, how this process works is kind of a, a black hole of confusion. Um, so as I mentioned, Article Three of the Constitution governs the appointment, tenure, um, and payment of Supreme Court justices, federal and circuit, federal circuit district court judges. Um, these are people who are nominated by the president and confirmed by the U.S. Senate. Um, these judges hold their office on good behavior, which means that they're given lifetime appointments, except under very limited circumstances. Um, very <laughs> limited. Um, they can be removed from office through impeachment by the House of Representatives and conviction by the Senate. Um, so again, that's not see something we're seeing every day or even ever, really. Um, the Senate Judiciary Committee, um, after the president has nominated um, somebody with the advice and consent from the Senate, the Senate Judiciary Committee considers both uh, the president's executive nominations and uh, judicial nominations. This process gets started when there's a vacancy. A vacancy occurs um, when a judge resigns or retires or takes senior status or, um, as we've seen recently, passes away. Um, generally speaking, judges give advance notice before a vacant, their vacancy occurs, um, except for in cases of death like uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg or Chief Justice Rehnquist. Um, Senior status is for judges who are semi-retired, um, so they're still here in cases, but at a much, much reduced um, level, and uh, the president can get the process started of filling, filling that vacancy. Um, once there is a vacancy, the White House will consult with home state senators for lower court nominees, um, and will solicit recommendations specifically for the district court level um, from senators. Uh, candidates then go through the vetting process, and after that's been completed, um, an announcement will be made, made about the nomination. Um, traditionally, uh, Senate Judiciary Committee uh, has what's called the blue, split, blue slip approval process um, from home state senators, where essentially they get the okay um, from the home state senators, but the ignoring of this practice is one of the ways that um, former Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and former President Trump were able to uh, pack the courts with their uh, picks or fill the courts with their picks rather. Um, so after that process, um, the Senate Judiciary Committee holds a hearing for the nominee um, where senators are able to review the record of the candidate and ask any questions about qualifications or uh, items in their records that they have questions about. Um, after the hearing, a majority of the Senate Judiciary Committee will vote the nominee out of committee. And if it's a split, the nominee will need a discharge petition. Um, this is more common now with uh, the current makeup of the Senate where the Senate Judiciary Committee is half Republican, half Democrat. Um, something to keep in mind as we're talking about a Supreme Court nominee is that a Supreme Court nominee will need at least one Republican vote um, or a discharge petition to move to the floor. Um, after that, Senator, the majority leader, who's now Senator Schumer, um, schedules a vote in the Senate, and a simple majority passes uh, the nominee on the floor into the president's desk where they begin their lifetime appointment. Um, also, the vice president can break a tie, um, again, in a Senate that's 50-50. Um, we do have the vice president's vote at this time. Um, to the question on uh, how the legal system has been historically a white male institution and the legacy of racism in the courts. Um, we know that uh, President Trump has been appointing judges that look and think like him for the last four years, but that racism didn't start um, with President Trump. So um, the first uh, black female lawyer was uh, Charlotte E. Ray, and she was admitted to the bar in DC in 1872. Um, she actually filed under the name C.E. Rays to disguise that she was female. And um, one thing that we don't talk about a lot is the ways in which um, the Supreme Court the following year actually ruled that the right to practice law um, was not among the privileges under the 14th Amendment. And it wouldn't be until 1971 um, that women, uh, that barring women from practicing law was actually prohibited in the United States. 
um, knowing that people live intersectional lives, um, looking at the legacy of racism in the courts in the 1930s, there were less than 100 black lawyers in the United States um, due to systemic discrimination. And even so now, um, the American Bar Association has found that black attorneys only make up roughly 4.7% of all lawyers, a number that's declined since 2011. Um, and when we look at the pipeline of how uh, judges are moving through the courts, when we look at state level courts, um, about 83% of state level high court judges are white. Wow, thank you, Nina. I think, you know, that's one of the important reasons why when we're talking about like qualifications for, you know, who we want to see nominated as federal judges, we say fair, independent, qualified, and those who reflect the diversity of our nation. Um, so that last point is particularly important. Um, so perhaps most importantly, how can pro-choice Catholics make a difference to ensure the confirmation of these types of judicial nominees? This is my favorite question because there's great ways that people can get involved. Um, it can start with calling your senator. Um, like I mentioned, especially with district court nominees, um, set, the Senate is deeply involved and senators have a say in who the president is nominating. Um, so we have the opportunity to really have our voices heard um, by, by calling your senator. Um, on the point of diversity in the court too, um, I think it's really essential that Congress ensures that the federal judiciary reflects the needs of the people and the makeup of the country. Um, one thing that's been really exciting is that President Biden has been making history um, already in his first year in office. Um, Biden has appointed more um, Senate confirmed judges to the federal bench in a single year than any other president since Ronald Reagan. Um, and Biden has nominated 24% of the total black women across the entire federal court system. Um, so it's only been a year, but big changes are coming. Um, his nominees are, have been 29% uh, black and 78% women. Um, and over half of those that have been confirmed by the Senate have been women of color. Um, he's also appointed and has been confirmed um, the first openly LGBTQ woman to serve on the Federal Court of Appeals and the first Black judge on the Federal Circuit. Um, I think one of the things as we're calling our senators to tell them how important the lower courts are um, is that this is the pipeline for the future of the judiciary. Mm -hmm. um, so as Biden's looking at who to nominate for the Supreme Court, they're looking at the lower courts as well. So the more um, amazing people we get <laughs> serving and reflecting our values, um, the more that they'll continue to grow as we rebuild our courts. Yeah, I'm glad that we could end your section on such a positive note um, and encouraging people to take action. Um, and we'll include some links in the chat about how you can do that and contact your senators at the end of the webinar. But next, we are going to move on to my wonderful friend, Jody. Um, since now that we understand a little bit more about how the federal courts and the judicial nominations process works, let's dive into why we should care. So who and what is impacted by the decisions of federal judges? How have the federal court decisions shaped the issues that we cared about, like reproductive and religious freedom? Well, first of all, I want to thank you, Shannon. Um, it's so great to be with you all. I um, feel like every time I, I talk to people about the courts and with people who are talking about the courts, I learned something. So Nina, thank you. I, I learned a few things I didn't know. And of course, um, it's a treat to be with Brandy as well and our friends at Catholics for Choice and all of you. Um, so the courts, why should we care? Well, you know, as Nina mentioned, many issues, um, just multiply that by all the issues, the courts impact every issue that we care about. So vaccine mandates, check, reproductive rights, check, marriage equality, check, you name it. Um, every issue makes its way through the federal courts, which means that federal judges impact every aspect of our lives. And as Nina just shared with us, the vast majority of the cases are heard in the lower federal courts, so those district and circuit courts. And uh, the Supreme Court generally hears 75 cases or so, maybe up to 100. So it's often these judges in these lower federal courts who are the last word on our rights. They are hearing cases every single day, 
making decisions that often last for generations. Um, so who is impacted? We are all impacted by the decisions that come out of these courts. And because, as I just mentioned, these decisions often last for generations, um, it's, it's our children, if we have any, or going to have any, and their children that are impacted. I think about Roe v. Wade and just putting it in the context of my life. Over the course of the 49 years that Roe v. Wade has been the law of the land, it impacted my mother's ability to decide when and if to have a family. It impacted my own decision making about when and if to have a family and my grown children's ability to make that decision. Just right, you know, looking at me, that's three generations right there. Legislation can be unfunded, defunded, um, it can sunset, it can be repealed, but these court decisions frequently stand shaping laws, policies, and our lives. So, um, you know, there, there are, are, anyway, that, I, I wanted to get that point across. And then of course, through the courts and the decisions, there are so many ways in which our reproductive freedoms and our religious freedoms have really been shaped for, for the good and the bad, of course. Yes. So in short, our federal courts matter. So what exactly. can you tell me about NCJW's fittingly named Courts Matter campaign? Why was it created and how has it changed over time? Sure. Um, well, NCJW has been working on the federal courts for decades. It, it certainly started out by working on every Supreme Court nominee, uh, certainly since the, the uh, early 1940s, uh, where we have records from when our Washington office was first established. But we launched um, our benchmark campaign. That's what we call our, our federal judicial nominations campaign. We launched it as an emergency campaign to save Roe almost two decades ago. And I have to laugh, not in a ha ha funny way, but like, here we are. <laughs> what seemed like an emergency more than two decades ago really feels like an emergency in this moment. Um, but it was through that campaign, that emergency campaign that we learned that the courts impact not just reproductive um, uh, freedom issues, but of course, all of the issues. And so we turned that campaign into an ongoing effort in which NCJW has been uh, really a leading voice in the progressive community's fight to ensure a fair and independent judiciary that has an unwavering commitment to constitutional rights. And so all year round, we work with our grassroots network to educate um, communities, on the importance of the judiciary, but also the people, the judges who sit on them and to mobilize them in a timely manner um, to uh, support nominees in many cases under President Biden and to oppose them um, under the last administration as, as um, again, as we heard a little bit from Nina. And so this work really is focused on, on building the fluency of the field um, and on diversifying the federal bench. So we do this in a couple of different ways. And I'll just briefly share that we run seven courts matter coalition. So you don't have to be an NCJW, you don't have to be Jewish, uh, you just have to care about the courts. Um, so we can plug folks into existing coalitions. We're always looking to expand, um, but they're around the country in Florida, Louisiana, Maine, Minnesota, Michigan, Missouri and Nebraska, I think that's all of them. And we provide resources on an ongoing basis and um, a regular weekly um, e-communication. So they've got, they know what's happening, they've got ways to plug in, and then we provide ongoing training opportunities. And then when it's not COVID, an in-person opportunity to network and really get skilled up. And then in Washington, day in and day out, we work with senators to help identify good folks to get in the pipeline, uh, to work with our folks in the field to help get good people in the pipeline, and then, of course, to advocate so that we get fair, independent, and qualified judges, as you mentioned, Shannon, um, who really represent a diversity of backgrounds and experiences. And we don't do this alone. So we do it with groups like Demand Justice. Um, we do it with uh, Nina and Planned Parenthood, Catholics for Choice, and then our partners on the state and local level. And I really want to stress that um, there are so many cases and so many times when we really follow, we might be doing this work in Washington, but we're really following the leadership of the folks in the field um, because they're the ones who are gonna be impacted by the folks who sit on this court. So it may be of particular importance to a certain community. Um, the seat may sit in a particular state. And so we'll really take our cues from the folks who are, are mo most impacted to do this work. Such incredible and important work, Jody. 
Can you break down what we mean when we say we advocate for fair, independent, and qualified federal judges who reflect the diversity of our society? And why is this criteria important to people of faith in particular? How does our shared commitment to justice drive us to support judicial nominees within this framework? It's such a good question. You know, I say those words all the time and I think, right, everybody knows what that means, but it's a really good question to sort of break it down. So um, I've mentioned, Nina mentioned that the, the vast majority of cases are in the um, federal and circuit courts. And um, so, you know, you want these judges to have the requisite trial or litigation experience or something equivalent so that they can manage the caseload, so they can resolve the many areas of law that face them daily. Um, the American Bar Association requires, um, it's a, a, a nonpartisan American Bar Association, I should mention, um, that uh, they require, I think it's about 12 years, so of accumulated experience and legal knowledge by practicing law and it really helps prepare someone who's going to sit on the federal bench um, with a wide variety of, of experiences and expertise in subject matter to to sort of serve on the court for lifetime tenure um, and also because they wield a tremendous amount of power that they really need to be impartial arbiters of the law so the independence of judges is just so essential to serve as a check um, on politicians in all branches of government, as we certainly saw over the last four years and, and often continue to see. So when they break the law or they violate the constitution. Um, and then, you know, I couldn't have put it better than Nina, the lack of diversity on the federal bench. It's, it's really shocking when you consider where we are today and under Biden, there's so many firsts on these courts, um, which is a wonderful opportunity, but it's still a challenge. It's mostly um, young white men who are on our federal courts and our courts really should reflect the populations they serve. They make better informed decisions um, when you've got a more well-rounded federal judiciary. And it also increases public confidence in the decision-making. I just wanna share a quote that I love and it was, um, there's this notion about um, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Justice uh, Sandra Day O'Connor said like a wise old man and a wise old woman would reach the same conclusion when deciding cases because they're following the law and Justice Sotomayor said before she was on the court that I would hope a wise Latina woman with the richness of her experiences would more often than not reach a better conclusion than a white male who hasn't lived that life. And I think that is um, sort of the perfect way to encapsulate how important the lived experience is on the bench. Um, and then of course, just very briefly, it's all important to people of faith, as you mentioned, Shannon, because we've got, we've got some shared values of, of justice, of, um, uh, you know, the establishment of freedom of and freedom from religion in our country and um, fairness, decency, human kindness, respect for the law, and of course, an independent judiciary. And, and so many of those themes just cross boundaries of faith and are so common among many faiths. So working on the courts and judicial nominees just goes hand in hand with our traditions um, and, and you know, our, our faith values and vision of the world that we want to see. I love that. And I so agree. You know, we have all of these shared values that drive, that drive us to do all of the work that we do, including supporting judicial nominees. So speaking of that, um, I know that the entire team at Catholics for Choice is eager to support the historic nomination of the first Black woman to serve on the Supreme Court of the United States ever. Um, so I'll welcome our final panelist, Brandy, to chat with me a little bit about this. So can you tell me a little bit about how your organization, She Will Rise, was born of President Biden's campaign, nom campaign promise to do so, and how you're working to hold him accountable? Absolutely. Thank you, Shannon. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to um, participate today um, and to the other amazing panelists um, and all of you who are joining. Um, I'd like to start with the origin story, so I appreciate that question, because it's rooted in four Black women um, who 
are strong, fierce, um, enthusiastic Americans. And in, 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 like when you really reduce sort of what this all came down to, um, three of the four of us are women. I'm a member of the Supreme Court. Um, and, you know, it was constantly looking outside of ourselves to solve the problem just never works. And we've sort of all been aligned in that walk in terms of how we choose to spend our time and energy. And we just decided, you know what, it's time. It's time to really make sure that there is an accountability here. Um, mm -hmm. And we were shocked, quite frankly, that when President Biden made that commitment, it sort of fell on deaf ears. I mean, it was sort of like, okay. Um, the reality, of course, is that in almost, you know, nearly 233 years since the creation of this institution, which literally serves as the highest court in the land, which has tremendous power over, you know, when you think about three executive branches and you think about what it takes to get to the point where you have the Supreme Court accept certiorari, take an opportunity to assess um, your decision and no easy decisions go to the Supreme Court, let's be clear. Um, you have to think and marvel at the fact that they almost have like this godlike quality, if you will. I mean, they literally can reverse generational societally accepted precedent um, and legally affirmed precedent. That is as close as you get to having godlike power here on earth. <laughs> and so I wanna just acknowledge the fact that with all of that power, it still does not reflect America. And with all of that power, we have had since 1789, um, a total of 115 judges, two of whom have been Black men, and only five have been women. And so, quite frankly, it's an abject failure. If you're going to call a social experiment an experiment, the numbers just don't add up. And I think that it should also be stated that while in this moment the president has made this commitment to a Black woman, and we firmly believe she will rise, that it is absolutely her time, um, we are certainly not done. She ought to not be the last. More importantly, we still have a lot of America to represent on this bench. It's absolutely critical. And so for us, it started with deciding what is the reason why it's gone so long? We decided to launch the campaign with um, by providing some historical context. And so we did that with Nicole Hannah-Jones from the 1619 Project. And I recognize that there can be some charges around that, but the bottom line is it's history. And we thought it was important for people to understand why we have um, currently slated to put a Black woman in space, but we have yet to get a Black woman nominated and confirmed to the Supreme Court. You needed to understand the history. And so we, we had the opportunity to have her frame that up so that people could understand the systems that for whatever reason, we have not been able to achieve this important goal. Um, one of the things that we decided we were gonna do because it's such a heavy topic is make it approachable and accessible. We were intentional about coming up with activations. We did a mural in DC. We were intentional about engaging black women artists. We had um, a photo set with black little girls dressed in robes after um, the great RBG passed on. And it was our way of saying, you can be this too, but you have to see it to believe it. Um, and when I had the opportunity to serve in the Obama administration, um, I had a chance to do a bit of judicial pipeline work around environmental cases. And that really helped me understand some of the nuances of the judiciary and also helped me, it humbled me quite frankly, because judges are not becoming billionaires doing this incredibly difficult work, right? They are, they are called, they are trained, they are skilled, they are humbled, and they are, um, compensated in a way that you know is, is respectful, but it is certainly not wealth driven. Um, one of the other things that I remember from my time uh, in service in the Obama administration is the photograph of President Obama where he's looking down at a little boy so that the little boy can touch his hair. And he's like, oh my gosh, you have hair like me. It was a little brown boy. And that was what we were trying to do with these photographs and these images. We all want to say to our daughters, our children, you too can be this. But oftentimes that hasn't happened for certain positions in America since its creation. So we were really intentional about saying, we wanna pull new demographics into this conversation. We want to move away from sometimes a narrative of angry black women 
This for us right now is a moment of utter joy. It is a moment of, oh my gosh, we are going to watch her rise. It is a moment of accountability because there are so many qualified Black women in particular that are ready to take this office um, on day one. And it also is a moment where we have demonstrated the power that we get farther working together, which is one of the reasons why I'm so grateful to have this opportunity today for us to share um, about the She Will Rise campaign and also the other Black women organizations. We're all working together and that is what allows us to get further together. You can get there fast by yourself, <laughs> but you really get there um, in a way that is sustainable when you go together. Um, I want to just lift up, Shannon, a couple of things that are on our website, and if folks are inclined, um, I would encourage you to check it out. But essentially, there were a few tools that we were trying to activate. One is a petition. And so right after the announcement, we fired off this petition and said, please sign this petition, um, basically saying President Biden has made this commitment, we are affirming this commitment, etc. We still would like for people to sign that petition. Every time we get more ticks, it's important for people to understand that this is still a mobilizing effort. Um, secondarily, and also because it's not just about getting the first, right? Secondarily, we also developed a judicial tracker. The tracker is designed to show um, folks where there are other Black women judges, not at the Supreme Court, of course, but throughout the judiciary. And sometimes you can see in the tracker, a few um, seats that are pending. We want you to reach out if you have relationships there. Why are they pending? What is taking so long with getting to the point of confirmation? Um, and it's a way to make sure that we are continuing to grow this very rich and fertile pipeline of women that can be in the position to uh, continue to serve us. I think the um, the other piece that's worth mentioning here is, um, and I think others have lifted it up, but. When it comes to correcting a wrong, because I do personally believe that to have never had this demographic represented is simply wrong. You have to also, um, and I, I, I will be honest, my bias is I, I um, do a lot of work in environmental law and policy. And so I think of things sometimes biologically in, in the context of an ecosystem. And when something is off kilter, things are out of balance. And when you're dealing with climate change, for example, what we're effectively trying to do is to rectify external external causes and the imbalance of external causes. And so when I think about the composition of this bench currently, there are societal externalities that we have not corrected as Americans because we do not have the proper representation. The ecosystem is off kilter, right? And so if you think about Black women who are three times more likely today to die in the childbearing process than their white female counterparts, something's off balance. They are effectively the canary in the coal mine around the reproductive system and the failures in the reproductive systems because that particular population for some reason is vulnerable, which means we are all vulnerable. When you think about today in 2022, black women make 63 cents on the dollar compared to their white male counterparts, something is wrong in the ecosystem. When you think about what we've experienced in terms of voting rights today, that is still in jeopardy for people who look like me something is off kilter. And so when I tell you that our lives depend on doing this work, we have our day jobs and then at night we put on our invisible capes and we do the work. We don't have a choice. Our children and our todays are totally dependent on getting this right. And so I wanna thank you for your partnership. I wanna thank you for your interest. And I wanna thank you for doing everything you can possibly do to talk about this, to reach out to folks who care about this work and to make sure that we get this right. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so, I love that you said invisible capes because as I was listening to you, I'm so inspired by this origin story. And I was like, I would watch a superhero movie about you today. <laughs> so I absolutely love that. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about how systemic racism has impacted the current makeup of our federal courts and the lack of diversity there. Can you tell me a little bit about how marginalized communities in the US, especially communities of color, have been denied their civil and human rights by Supreme Court rulings? And how could the court benefit from a Black woman justice sharing her point of view in deliberation with her colleagues? Yeah. Um, so I mentioned a few of the pieces in terms of the, the um, 
wealth inequality, reproductive rights and inequality there. I think, you know, we all know and see it every day. I mean, we're listening now to um, what effectively sound like huntings of black men, right? We're listening to the Arbery case now going through the civil rights of the um, civil case. And it, it's, um, it's important to note um, that there is an impact to everyone when you are listening to murder with your morning coffee, right? There's something that you just, in, you inherently internalize if you see your brothers, your fathers, your partners, your husbands, right? Um, you could see their faces and you wonder, oh, do you need to go to the store? Mm, you know, you have to just appreciate that there is a sensitivity to um, the fact that there is this incredible fear around the black body. And so I do think that that dynamic is something that as Americans, we have to continue to work through. And I think having a woman who is black, who because of the package that she's just in, she will bring a different atmospheric dynamic to the room. And I think all of us who have been in only in any context, I know if I walk into a room and they're all men, you know, there are things you might do just to break up the ice if you feel like that's necessary, but we're all sort of put on notice because you know that there's a difference. And what we have to sit in is that that difference is not threatening. <laughs> that difference is just that. And we should hear out what the difference is and account for it in our decision making. And that's what we're asking for. We're asking for someone who's fair, who's independent, who's clearly qualified, who can also bring to bear their lived experiences. We've seen this in marketing campaigns when you have other lived experiences who then are able to say, mm, you might not wanna do that. That might trigger this, right? It's to the benefit of the greater good. Um, I do think Shannon that, you know, in, in this, moment, what we are really hopeful, um, or at least we, we talk a lot about wanting a respectful process, um, really, you know, let's move beyond some of the tactical um, uh, weight amount dynamics that can often uh, accompany the gamesmanship of the confirmation process. Um, but I think this is an opportunity where Republicans and Democrats across the board can say, yeah, it is time that we correct this, right? And I know that that might seem foolhardy, but I do think we have elections coming up. And I think that both parties know that the Black woman uh, demographic in particular is incredibly fierce and loyal when it comes to voting rights. They, mar they, they are absolutely effective at getting folks out um, and showing up to the polls. And I think some of what we saw in some of the... Um, Voting decisions as of late, and Georgia in particular had, I think, a very charged voting law where it's illegal to give out bottles of water. I mean, there are some nuances to the process for a reason. And so in 2022, again, where voting rights are still something that are at jeopardy for one demographic of our great union, you do have to wonder um, what is going to continue to give people faith in this system, inclusion. Yeah, and you know, as we are preparing for the nominee to be announced, you're right, we are really hoping for a respectful process and that people from across both aisles can, you know, really, you know, take a look at the nominee and just see how qualified and amazing that, yeah. that this nominee will be. So and there's, one, there's one other thing, Shannon, if I can. It's just, you know, I also think there's sometimes a narrative that you're gonna put some, you know raging liberal <laughs> on the bench, people need to be really clear. And, and I think this was lifted up earlier, but these decisions in terms of who is currently sitting on the bench, these have been set for generations to come, right? So the current bench composition wise, six, three, it is a conservative bench that will not change with this confirmation. There's just nothing that can happen that will change with this confirmation um, in terms of the fact that the majority of this particular bench at this moment in time is conservative. So I think the hysteria around that is, is something that has to be grounded in fact. This is about a progressive um, Justice Breyer, and Breyer has done an incredible job of, of serving and really trying to, um, I think, being collegial in his service, which we appreciate. Yeah. He is you know, going to be replaced by someone um, who is not going to tip the balance. And I think that's also important for people to acknowledge in this moment. Yes. So 
As my final question, what can you tell us about this upcoming confirmation process and some of the potential nominees on President Biden's shortlist and how can we support her? Yeah, I think I'm going to leave it pretty high level. I think you all have heard her names. There are three women that are on the shortlist. They are all immensely qualified. Two are absolutely sort of what are more traditionally perceived as the Ivy Tower um, pipelines, just in terms of their academic credentials. Um, the other, Michelle Childs out of South Carolina, is someone who has received a lot of support from Senator Clyburn and some others um, in a bipartisan manner, and is not someone who comes from all Ivy institutions. Again, all incredibly qualified women. When you look at their records, you, um, you really have to be humble, period. I mean, and, and quite frankly, these are women who, again, have never seen a Black woman on the Supreme Court. So yes, maybe it's been something that they would love to see in time, but it's certainly never something that they have yet to see. And yet they have these remarkable credentials. Process-wise, we are waiting. We are constantly checking and checking and checking <laughs> because we expect to hear um, any moment. Um, and I think quite frankly, you know, we all appreciate if you've had a chance to serve as well, that there are always things that are moving um, outside of what you think are the issues of the day. There are world issues that happen that sometimes uh, recalibrate the White House's agenda, but we do um, pretty much anticipate no later than this week, if not um, much sooner. So when that happens, of course, that is just the naming of her, um, which will be absolutely joyous. The work then begins to go through the confirmation process. And that will um, be heavily dictated by the questions. Um, we know that we will have congressional members in town next week working hard to move this process forward. Um, and, and frankly, you know, we saw with Amy Coney Barrett, it took 27 days. So it could be extremely swift um, or it could not. We also know we have midterm elections coming up soon, which are expected to be um, more contentious than usual. And so there are, there are a lot of sort of political inside the Beltway politics and also state level politics. And I'll tell you, one of the things that we're really intentional about doing is working with other groups to do outreach at the state level so that this is a decision that is felt um, across all of our beautiful United States. Yes, thank you so much. So I think with that, we are going to open it up to audience Q&A. Um, and I did want to start with a question that had been submitted to us ahead of time, which is about um, lower court nominees. So are there any lower court nominees we can support right now? Um, and can the Judiciary Committee continue to move forward with these nominees while we await President Biden's announcement? So Jody, Nina, um, any lower court nominees that we could be supporting right now? Just, I'm happy to jump in, but I really welcome uh, my colleagues to do so as well. Um, I, I'm building on the joy that, that Randy mentioned, and it is a truly joyous time to be working on the courts because there are some incredible nominees. So I'm just gonna name a handful, I'm certainly not gonna to get to all of them, but um, there is Nancy Abudu to the 11th Circuit who has been nominated. There is uh, Justice Stephanie Dawkins uh, Davis. I hope I got her name correct. Nina, please jump in and correct me. Um, for, the, for the Sixth Circuit, um, and there are some really incredible folks who are working their way through the process who have um, really uh, deep experience as um, uh, judges, some as public defenders, um, just incredible backgrounds and um, uh, really keen intellect. So um, it's a real uh, diversity of folks for um, seats around the country. And we're just starting to see some nominations for seats that are um, not all uh, in states with two Democratic senators like Andre mm -hmm. Mathis for um, a seat in Tennessee. So um, it's, an, it's an exciting time to be for folks and to be supportive of people who really bring a richness in background and experience um, in education. 
um, and, and professional diversity. That's great. So, so this is something I've heard a lot is that we can walk and chew gum at the same time and we can continue to be advancing these lower court nominees while we're waiting for an announcement about the Supreme Court nominee. That's 100% right. And um, appreciate you lifting that back up, Shannon. It is something that we're committed to do as advocates. So reminding senators that they can um, vet a Supreme Court nominee and work on the nomination, um, whether they're on the Senate Judiciary Committee or, or off, but they can take the time to educate themselves, meet with the nominee, learn about their background and experience at the same time that they're voting on um, lower court nominees. Brandy mentioned there are all kinds of things that are always happening in Congress and somehow they're able, you know, as you said, to walk and chew gum and to deal with sort of must pass budget items and the, um, you know, every two week churn of uh, hearings on judicial nominees and uh, Senate Judiciary Committee processes and then getting, uh, getting those folks to the floor. So while it is a balancing act, um, Senate Majority Leader Schumer and Senate Judiciary Committee Chair Durbin are committed to uh, continuing to fill these, these vacancies on the lower courts and to move uh, the Supreme Court nominee quite swiftly. And again, Brandy mentioned the uh, midterms coming up. That's no joke. So mm -hmm. um, though I know this is a 501c3 call, it is important while there are so many vacancies um, and sort of not knowing what is to come that the president moved quickly to name folks and that the Senate moved just as quickly to confirm folks, both to the open seats on the lower courts and the Supreme Court. Yes, and to your 501c3 point, I did wanna reference a question that we had also gotten in that is working to support or oppose judicial nominees 501c3 friendly. And the answer to that is absolutely yes, because judicial nominees and executive nominees for that matter are voted on by the Senate, like pieces of legislation are, it is absolutely acceptable for 501c3 organizations to be advocating on them. Um, and I think we have one final question. We have time for one final question, um, which is, will Justice Breyer still vote on and participate in decisions for the cases the court heard this term? I think this is a really important question considering that, you know, the timeline is still up in the air for when the newest justice will be announced and confirmed. And the answer to this question is that, yes, he will still vote on and participate in the cases that the court has heard this term. So that includes um, Jackson Women's Health Organization, which is the direct challenge to Roe versus Wade that Nina mentioned. Um, so that is actually all the time that we have for today. Um, I want to thank you so much to Brandy, Jody, and Nina for sharing their time and expertise with us and to all of you for joining our discussion. Before we go, I did just want to talk about how you can take action to support independent, qualified, and diverse judicial nominees today. Um, so you will see in the follow-up email, a link to NCJW's Courts Matter campaign, to Planned Parenthood's Reclaim Our Courts, and also to She Will Rise's website where you can find all of the resources that um, Brandy mentioned. Um, you'll also see that you can visit Catholics for Choices website so you can quickly and easily email your senators and show your support for a Supreme Court justice who, adva who will advance civil rights, equal rights, and individual liberties for all. And finally, while we have you, we can't resist plugging our action alert urging the Senate to pass the Women's Health Protection Act because they will be voting on that important bill to protect abortion access nationwide next Monday, um, February 28th. Um, so thank you again, all of for being with us today. You can see the links on your screen right now. Um, and in the next couple of days, you'll receive a follow-up email with a recording of today's event and links to all of this. Um, it will also tell you how to join our Facebook group so that you can become a part of the community that we are building there. We're so grateful that you're a part of the Catholics for Choice family, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>